Okay, hi everyone and welcome to our April webinar. I am really delighted to welcome Valerie Love as our guest this month and she's going to be talking about managing stress in the glam sector. So I'll just pass it on to Valerie to introduce herself and uh, give her webinar. Great, thank you Julia. Um, kia ora koutou, ko Valerie Love aho, no America aho, e mahiana ki te puna motoranga o Aotearoa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou koutoua. Um, so hi everyone, um, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Valerie Love and I am the Senior Digital Archivist at the Alexander Turnbull Library at the National Library of New Zealand in Wellington. Um, so, as my accent and nihi give away, I am a transplant to Aotearoa. Um, I grew up in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania in the United States, and I have a master's degree in library and information studies focusing on archival administration. Um, my first taste of the glam life was as a student assistant in the Smith College archives, um, where um, I was tasked, among other things, um, lots of making photocopies, but I also got to rehouse um, the papers of Sylvia Plath and put them into new acid-free folders and boxes. And from that point, I was pretty much hooked on archives. Um, but in addition to my archival and library career, I'm also a trained yoga teacher and I've been teaching yoga for the past eight years. And in a lot of ways, my, um, my library and archival work and my yoga and wellness activities have really been intermingled. And I actually started practicing yoga in the first place um, because I was working as a processing archivist on a collection of 400 boxes and moving boxes and lifting them up to the top shelf in the stacks. And I was starting to have um, some lower back pain at the ripe old age of 25. And I thought, well, that's no good. Um, and one of my friends suggested that I try yoga. And I have to admit, it wasn't immediately, you know, love at first class or anything like that. Um, but it did start making my back feel a lot better and a lot stronger um, and I kept going and over time I realized so many benefits from a steady yoga practice both physically and also mentally um, that I decided to study it more formally. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is um, self-care and the ways of managing stress in the glam sector. And I think this is a really important topic and I wanted to talk about it for a few reasons. Um, mainly because no one is immune to stress. And I think that people often underestimate the amount of stress that people working in libraries and archives and museums and records management face. Um, so there's been other conversations about this, of course. Um, I definitely want to acknowledge the, the work of Beth Wishart and Kat Katris, who gave a presentation at the 2015 Lianza Conference on dealing with workplace stress in libraries. And as I recall, they had a pretty packed room, so it was definitely a topic of interest. Um, there's also been recent dialogue on Twitter, um, and today's um, presentation actually came out of an earlier talk that I gave um, along with a colleague on um, at the National Digital Forum um, last November. And one of our lessons from um, a big system transformation project um, was actually um, self-care and the importance of taking care of yourself when you're working on big, stressful projects. Um, so the per for the purpose of today's webinar, I'm just going to be talking about the following. Um, so types of stress, the impact of stress on the physical body and mental health, some common stressors in the glam sector, um, ways of managing stress as individuals, um, a very brief introduction to pranayama, which is yogic breath work, um, and some organizational ways of managing stress, and then resources and support. So before we begin, I have a few disclaimers. Um, so the first and, and most important one is that I'm an archivist. I'm, I'm not a doctor or a mental health professional. Um, so I've learned a lot from my teachers over the years, but what I know is just a small piece of the puzzle. Um, so if you have any concerns about your own well-being, please go um, talk to a, a professional. Um, the other thing is just that everyone is unique. So what I'm sharing with you is what I know and some of the things that work for me in terms of managing my own stress. Um, there's no one answer that's going to work for everyone all the time. So it really is a lot of self-study and finding what works for you. Um, this webinar is being recorded. It's going to be made available online afterwards. Um, but I've asked Julia not to record the Q&A. So that way, if anybody, um, sorry, 
I'm not sure if that's my computer making the noise. Um, but so that way, if anybody does want to talk a little bit, they can do so freely and the, the discussion at the end will not be recorded and not be made online. Um, but the rest of the webinar will. Um, and on that note, just hold your questions to the end. Um, so first of all, what do we mean by stress? Um, so stress is a state of mental or emotional strain or tension resulting from adverse or demanding circumstances. Um, but the term stress originally um, was coined um, by Hans Seely, who was a Hungarian-Canadian endocrinologist, and he defined it as a nonspecific response of the body to any demand for change. So it didn't actually matter whether the stimulus was good or bad, just the fact that it was a change at all and required the body to do something differently um, was considered to be um, stress. So not all stress is bad. Um, good stress moves us forward um, and you know, motivates us and, you know, and is a really healthy thing and prevents boredom. Um, but bad stress um, can begin to hinder everyday life. And so that bad stress is what I'm really focusing on today. Um, and while we often think of stress as being a mental feeling, um, particularly as that um, Oxford de um, Dictionary definition says, um, stress is in fact really a hardwired physical response. So the feeling of stress and the mental feeling that we have of stress is really because of certain biological functions that are happening in the body. So acute stress is the physiological response to danger. Um, the adrenal glands, which um, sit on top of the kidneys, will, submit, will secrete stress hormones. And these um, trigger um, changes within the body, and these are autonomic changes, so they happen without us having to think or do anything. Um, they, just, they just happen based upon these, um, these chemical secretions. Um, and so, this, um, so the stress hormones um, stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. And the sympathetic nervous system in the body is what triggers that fight, free, um, flight, or freeze response. So our heart rate, our blood pressure, um, mental activity, um, muscle tension, um, the glucose will get sent to the muscles. Um, all of these things um, start to activate. Um, you may find that you begin to sweat or feel flushed. Um, so that's all sort of signs that the sympathetic nervous system is being activated in the body. Um, the other thing that happens is that because the body is preparing itself essentially for a battle of some sort, whether it's running away from a predator or being able to fight, um, the non-essential systems um, get less energy. So things like digestion and growth and, and reproduction, um, these functions that are controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system, are all, um, all get less energy. So then once the danger has passed and the body synthesizes the stress hormones, it returns to that homeostasis or balance, and then those other systems come back online. So with chronic stress, um, the more stress that you're under, the more acute stress that you're under, um, the more cortisol your body produces. Um, and when the body begins to produce cortisol a lot, because you're dealing with lots of stress, um, it can be harder for the body to process those chemicals and to um, return to that state of balance. And so when that happens, um, it can start to lead to, um, in the, the medium term, it can start to lead to things like anger or anxiety or hypervigilance, where you're just on edge all the time. And it is part of this, this physical chemical reaction. Um, the, one of the things that's challenging about that is that if, if those systems stay activated and your body is, current, is, is constantly flooded with cortisol and, and these other chemicals, um, your body can't actually maintain that, um, that activation for a really long period of time. It's always meant to be a temporary function. So if you are feeling a lot of a lot of this vigilance or a lot of anxiety, um, your body can just get physically exhausted and it can't actually maintain that, that activated level. And so that can then lead to things like exhaustion and decreased immunity and depression and inflammation and sometimes physical pain. Um, so our body has lots of ways of sort of telling us that something isn't quite right. Um, the other thing, too, is that everybody responds to stress differently, um, and you also respond differently to stress depending upon what else is going on. Um, 
So your life experiences will impact the way that your body um, processes stress, genetics, um, social structures as well. Um, so the exact same situation may be incredibly stressful for one person and another person might find it a little bit less stressful, even though it's sort of that same, um, the exact same situation. Um, so some of the signs and symptoms of chronic stress, and I'm not going to talk about this too much, but just give you some indicators of things to begin to look out for. Um, so it's, it's things like, you know, difficulty falling asleep at night, um, physical fatigue, um, that muscle tension or physical pain that I've mentioned, um, digestive issues. Um, your stomach will often tell you if you're feeling quite stressed. Um, you know, but just sort of also, you know, things like apathy, withdrawing, because you just have reached that point of, I can't even, um, you know, just having to take more sick days. Um, and then also just sort of having more, um, more caffeine or more alcohol, because you just feel like you need it to get through. Um, and this is just um, a poem that I, that I quite like. Um, that sort of talks about some of the, the things that we encounter in our daily lives. There's so much that we're being bombarded with constantly. Um, and so it is just important to sort of cultivate an awareness of all the things that are, that are coming at you for your attention and um, begin to just sort of step back and observe. And that's something that we talk a lot, a lot about in yoga, that practice of observation without judgment. Um, so the first step in managing stress is really just noticing, um, realizing that, that you're feeling that stress and acknowledging that. Um, so there's also um, psychological stressors, and these are things that um, everybody faces at some point in their life. I mean, nobody is immune to um, these types of things. Um, and again, as long as the body is processing um, the, the stress hormones and getting back to that, um, that place of homeostasis, then there's not a problem. Um, but if the body gets stuck in a cycle of stress without resolution and gets stuck in that cortisol feedback chain, um, that's where you can start to experience some of those, um, some of those issues in the previous slide. Um, so sometimes stress is caused by quite a simple uh, physical um, experience in the body. Um, so things like injuries um, or um, you know, dehydration um, creates stress in the body. And so that physical stress can impact the way that you respond to things as well. Um, so, you know, lack of sleep, um, you know, you, you may find yourself feeling more anxious or, or um, you know, having um, more st uh, stronger stress responses. Um, and I've also just put here, um, you know, consumption of allergenic or inflammatory foods. Um, for me personally, this was quite a big one um, because I um, have a dairy intolerance and I didn't realize that. And so for years and years and years, I had all these issues of um, inflammation and fatigue and, and digestive issues and had no idea that it was actually this really physical, this physical thing that was putting stress on my body. Um, and so once I, once I realized that and was able to cut those things out of my diet, um, a lot, like all of the issues um, of, of fatigue um, really went away quite quickly. Um, so sometimes it's not just that you can't handle the stressful situations in your life, you know, like, you know, like buying a house or, or these, these things like that. Sometimes there is actually a physical reason why your body is stressed and it's not work. Um, so I just want to point that out there as well. Um, again, that's not going to be the case for everybody, um, but it is something to, um, um, to, to um, consider. Um, so getting into our stressors in the glam sector, and I don't want this slide to, to stress anyone out. Um, I've put it in here because there are a lot more um, potential stressors in this field than, than people think. Um, and I think it is actually really important to acknowledge that. Um, so, I mean, nobody goes into library and archival work for, um, you know, for the money or the fame. Um, but at the same time, there is a lot of uncertainty in this, in this field. And, you know, we're, we're in the business of providing access to information and knowledge and preserving culture and history and documenting contemporary life. And there's just never enough resources to actually do all of that. 
and you know pretty much every institution you know everywhere i've worked both you know in in the us and in new zealand and talking to colleagues around the world you know everybody seems to be facing these same issues of having to make really difficult decisions about you know what to collect and how to cope with less funding and less staffing um, and at the same time, the user expectations are higher than ever and user needs are higher than ever for, you know, for libraries and archives and, and museums. Um, and in a lot of places, libraries have really become um, um, like social support um, um, systems and community centers as well. I mean, particularly in places like Christchurch, where public libraries have played a massive role in terms of helping people um, to, to cope and find resources um, after the earthquakes. Um, so it's, there's a lot um, that goes on um, in, in this sector. And the other thing that I just want to touch upon really briefly too is, um, you know, working with difficult collections um, subject matter. Um, so one of my previous roles was the curator for human rights collections. And so I was working with really sensitive and, and really challenging and, and heartbreaking content quite a lot. Um, and one of the things that I discovered really quickly was that I needed to come up with strategies to shelter myself from some of that because I am quite a sensitive person. And you know, working with oral histories and photographs and, and people's stories of, of loss and heartbreak day in and day out is really, really intense. Um, so if you are working with types of, of with materials like that, it's, it's really important to find ways to distance yourself and to also take a break and, and take some space when you need it. Um, so this is one of my favorite quotes. <laughs> um, this is a quote by Caitlin Moran, and I think it was actually advice that she gave to her daughter. Um, when I was working on that system transformation and um, collection management replacement system, I had this quote by my desk um, because it was quite a stressful, stressful project. And it was just a nice reminder to, to get up, get away from the computer, take a break, make sure that your basic needs are met, that you've, you know, that you're hydrated, that you've had something to eat. Um, and I see this a lot. I see people sitting at their desks and they're in the middle of something and then suddenly they realize it's 2 p.m. and they haven't had lunch. Um, so just being aware of those really basic physical needs um, goes a long way in terms of, of managing stress. Um, so really briefly, I want to touch upon um, signs of stress within an organization and the types of things that we begin to see when, um, when an organization as a whole is exhibiting signs of stress. And so that's things like absenteeism and, you know, more, more sick days, people, you know, people, you know, sort of disengaging. Um, also presenteeism is a big issue. And presenteeism is where people come into work because they feel that they have to. Um, and maybe they're sick and they really shouldn't be at work that day. Um, or maybe they don't take their annual leave because they feel that there's this project or there's, there's something that they absolutely need to be in the building for. And so it's really important to sort of break down that culture and make sure that people know that they can take breaks um, and that if they you know, if, if their energy is in a place where it's really negative and actually starting to um, be a blocker for other staff and is starting to, um, you know, impact the, the culture in a negative way, that it's really important that, um, you know, that organizations recognize that and come up with some strategies to help that person um, feel, um, feel that they can take a break. Um, and also um, to, to make sure that, um, that there is a, a positive work environment. And that is easier said than done, admittedly. Um, so almost anything will work again if you unplug it for a few minutes, including you. Um, and being somebody who works as a digital archivist and is often dealing with tech, like this is so true. <laughs> um, so it's really, again, taking a break. I can't I really can't stress it enough. So when, so when you find yourself in those moments of acute stress, um, one of the best places to begin is, first of all, as, as I've mentioned previously, acknowledging that you're in a state of stress, and then pausing and taking a breath. So I'm just going to um, invite us to actually do that right now. Um, 
So if you are um, seated, um, find a comfortable position, maybe putting the soles of the feet flat on the floor, sitting up in your chair a little bit, lengthening through the spine, letting the hands rest on the, la the lap, maybe even closing the eyes if you're comfortable doing that. And just allow yourself to notice the breath. Noticing the natural rhythm. And then beginning to deepen and lengthen your inhalation. So breathing a little bit fuller. And perhaps beginning to work with the Dirga breath, which is our three part full yogic breath. So on the inhalation, the breath expands through the lower belly and the inhale continues as the breath rises up to the rib cage and even up towards the collarbones. So we're filling the lungs completely, bottom, middle and top. And on the exhalation, allowing the breath to release from those same three spaces, from the collarbones, from the rib cage, and finally feeling the belly button drawing in towards the spine, letting the breath fully release from the body, making room for the next inhalation. And breathing fully and deeply, letting the lungs expand, inviting fresh oxygen into the body and letting go of any energy that's not serving you. Um, so that's just a brief example of the, the Dirga breath. Um, the Ujjayi breath is another yogic breath that we use. And with the Ujjayi breath, um, the breath can continue um, with the basis of that, that Dirga breath, that three-part really deep breath, trying to fill up the lungs. Um, but the Ujjayi breath, on the exhalation, there's a gentle constriction at the back of the throat. And that gentle constriction creates um, a gentle hissing, or um, some people call it an ocean sound. And I'll just demonstrate that um, really briefly. And what that little constriction at the back of the throat on the exhalation does is it helps to stimulate that parasympathetic nervous system. So it helps to create that relaxation response in the body. Um, during a physical yoga practice of the asana or the postures, um, that sound of the breath is often used to help um, students to, um, to move at the same pace of their breath by making it audible. Um, and that breath also just helps to um, warm up the body as well. Um, the third um, breath I've mentioned here is um, Nadi Shodhana. I'm not really going to demonstrate that today because it's a little bit tricky, um, but I do have a video at the end that you're welcome to um, check out for a bit more information. Um, but I will just talk about Nadi Shodhana um, really briefly. Um, so this is alternate nostril breathing, um, where basically you um, will cover one nostril with, uh, with one of your fingers or the thumb, um, and then you'll breathe in through the opposite nostril, and then you'll close off that other nostril and breathe out through, through the right, for example. And then breathe in through the right, closing it off, breathing out through the left, inhaling through the left, closing it off, breathing out through the right. And that is a little bit funny. It feels a bit weird at first, um, but it's a really, really powerful breath. Um, so that one is really, really good for um, settling anxiety. Um, um, one of my, um, there is a, there's a woman in Wellington, uh, Marianne Elliott, who, um, who is a yoga teacher and a friend. And she um, wrote about Nadi Shodhana in her book about her time um, being stationed with the, the UN in Afghanistan and talked about how powerful that breath was in terms of being in a highly stressful environment and being able to use as a tool to keep herself calm and centered. And her book is called Zen Under Fire, if you haven't heard of it, not to do a little plug, um, but it is quite, a, quite an interesting read. Um, and then finally, um, 
putting your legs up the wall, and that's what the photo in um, the slide is. Um, there's not really an elegant way to do that. You just sort of um, sit as close to the wall as you can and then swing, swing your legs up. Um, obviously, that depends on what your physical state at the, at the time is. Um, you know, obviously, that's not going to be accessible to everyone. But um, having your legs elevated above your heart um, helps to, helps to um, reverse the impact of gravity um, during the day. So gravity is pulling our blood flow more easily downward into the legs, and this reverses that. So this means that the blood is able to flow more easily down to the vital organs, the heart, the lungs, and the brain. Um, and this posture is said to help with insomnia and again, to stimulate that parasympathetic nervous system and help the body begin to relax. Um, so these are just really basic things um, that you can do when you're feeling quite stressed, um, and they really do help. Um, even just noticing how you're feeling now after, you know, after doing, you know, just a couple of moments of, of Dirga breath, it does, you know, I can certainly feel the difference. Um, and hopefully it's, it's something that um, will, will help as well. Um, so witnessing the moment that I can't overestimate how important this is, checking in with yourself and knowing that there's going to be times where something is really stressful and you're not okay. And that's, that's part of being human. And sometimes that happens at work. And that's, if, if that's what it is, that's what it is, you know, so letting go of the judgment and also being kind to your colleagues, you know, um, I think that's really, really essential. Um, and the other thing too, that is really helpful um, is finding something small to be grateful for because even just that moment of gratitude in the brain helps to switch it from the sympathetic state to the parasympathetic state so just pausing and finding something that you're grateful for maybe it's just that you're in, you know you're you're inside and you're out of the wind um, on a day like today in wellington i'm certainly grateful for that um, so just finding finding that little tiny piece of gratitude can be really, really helpful when you're, when you're in that moment of acute stress. Um, so putting things into perspective, um, this has probably been the most valuable way that I have been able to manage my stress. Um, again, working with human rights collections, working with digital collections and having technology issues and, you know, just all the things that you encounter. Um, so, putting things into perspective. You know, if, if there's a corrupted file on a disk, there's a corrupted file on a disk. You know, nothing I can do can change that. So it's, it's putting things into perspective. Um, it's also really, really important to make sure that there's balance in your life and that you're not putting all of your energy into work. Um, and I've, you know, I've made this mistake as well, you know, and I've, I've seen it um, in students as part of the reason why they come to yoga classes in the first place, where their work has become intense to a point of not being sustainable. And so they're looking to recreate that balance and to find a way of, um, you know, of, of just bringing some more wellness and something outside of work into their life. Um, and I, another one that has been really useful is just stepping away from the computer. You know, if you're in that moment and you're stuck, um, I've often found that just taking a break, you know, getting outside can really spark those insights and then I can come back to whatever problem fresh. Um, so we've already talked about a lot of this, so I won't go over it in much detail, um, but just to take note of some of the ways of managing your own stress in that moment. Um, and, the, and it's really important to, um, you know, to not assume the worst um, and to still find that, that glimmer of hope even in adversity. And I know that's so hard and I completely fail on that and you know, over and over and you just kind of keep trying to get better. Um, and looking for ways to respond instead of simply reacting. And ideally to respond in a way that's going to build your well-being instead of destroy it. Um, 
And getting back to that NDF talk, um, one, of my, one of my lessons from the project was um, acknowledging when something is actually too much and honoring your limits. Um, because if you um, absolutely burn yourself out, then you're not, actually, um, you're not actually benefiting the profession or your organization or your, your own career. Um, so it's, it's taking care of yourself is just as important as, um, you know, as, 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 as the work. Um, in the longer term, ways of managing your stress. Um, so again, boundaries, um, setting those priorities, um, you know, looking for simplicity. Um, you know, we sometimes make things really, really complicated and, and they don't need to be quite that complicated. Um, you know, if, if you're able to let go of some decisions that you don't need to be the one to make, um, that can be really helpful too. Um, using your support network, using your team, you know, and just just acknowledging that um, that you know you, you've you've got this this project or this this collection that you're working on that's really intense, and people will generally understand that and they'll want to support you. Um, and the other thing that has been really really useful for me is to remember that you're hardwired for resilience. Um, so if you know, I have definitely been in, you know, in, in periods of stress where I've felt like it's just going to always be this way. And that's simply not the case. Um, so, you know, everything is temporary. Um, you know, no moment lasts forever, as cliche as that is. Um, but you are, you are able to get through. And sometimes just remembering that and reminding yourself that you're able to get through um, makes a world of difference. Um, so I'm, I really do like this, um, this karakia because it really, um, it really does remind us that, you know, taking care of our people is, is key. Um, and I'm not going to read it because my pronunciation is still a work in progress, um, but it is, it is really beautiful and something that I, I take to heart. Um, so this one is mostly for the managers among us and the administrators who might be watching this. Um, and you know, everybody has a role to play in terms of workplace wellness, um, but well-being and a good work environment and managing stress really um, comes from the top down. So if, um, you know, if, if the senior um, people in your organization don't view it as a priority, um, then it's, it makes for a really challenging work environment. And so it's really important to advocate for that to become a priority. Um, you know, again, like really small things can make a difference. Um, you know, I've oftentimes, you know, just having a shared cup of tea, it can really help calm people down and, and just being aware of your own energy as well. Um, at our, um, our digital collections team meeting, we start the team meeting with um, a breathing exercise and we do about, you know, just a minute of, of mindful breathing. And then that sets the tone for the rest of the meeting where, you know, whatever people were doing before, if they were, you know, you know interacting with, with, um, with people or, or, you know, sort of working through a problem, they're able to come to that team meeting a bit fresher. Um, and so it's, it's definitely worth, uh, worth a try. Um, and yeah, and then just trusting your staff and listening to them. And if somebody comes up to you with a concern, you know, acknowledge that. Um, it's, it's really easy to sort of, you know, think that, oh, somebody's being dramatic or, you know, this, this isn't actually a big deal or, you know, this is, this is the way it is for everybody. Um, but that's actually not helpful. Um, so really um, paying attention to um, concerns and building that, that culture of Fanonga Tonga and Nanaki Tonga um, to make sure that people are cared for within the, the organization. Um, and these are just my final thoughts. Um, when you feel that you are too busy to take a break is really when you need it the most. Um, so again, just that one minute of deep breathing, it makes a world of difference. 
Um, the other thing is that self-care doesn't have to be time consuming or expensive. Um, you know, it can be things like, you know, massage and acupuncture and things like that, and they can be quite expensive. But it can also just be, you know, going to bed a bit earlier. I've switched to decaf, which feels like a terrible thing to admit in Wellington, but it has been really beneficial for, um, you know, for my health and well-being. Um, and the other thing too, um, magnesium. Um, it's really, really easy to be low on magnesium and it's such an important mineral for the body that um, really helps support the nervous system and helps support relaxation and sleep. Um, so it's, yeah, it's definitely worth um, talking to um, a doctor or a wellness professional about um, to see if it's something that might be, be beneficial. Um, and then my final thought is really the most important one, and that's simply to ask for help when you need it. Um, I, you know, I'm a yoga teacher and, you know, and, and I meditate and, you know, and I go tramping and I do all these things that are, you know, stereotypically all the right things in terms of being healthy and, you know, eating well and all these things, you know, and I still have stress and I still have periods of, of depression and anxiety. Um, and once you're in that place, it's nearly impossible to get out of it on your own. You need your support. You need, you know, medical, um, you know, um, like, yeah, I mean, so it's, so just really, you know, asking for help when you need it and making sure that you get to that place where you're able to take care of yourself again. Um, so finally, sorry, the, the last couple of slides are my resources, which I promise I'm wrapping this up. Um, but finally, just a few things that are on my bookshelf and my cat Hazel walked into the slide or it walked into my, walked into the photo as I was taking it. And I thought that was perfect because Hazel is actually one of the ways that I relieve my own stress by, you know, having her sit on my lap and just, you know, petting my beautiful tabby cat. Um, and the other thing too that I found really, really useful was um, the life plan by Shanna Kennedy. Um, sorry, um, which is this book over here, um, and it really just helps you sort of realize where you're at, and then helps you discover what the priorities are in your life, and helps you work towards making those, um, you know, saying no to the things that are not going to help you get move towards those priorities. Um, and it's been, it, I found it really, really helpful. It's a really accessible resource. Um, and then finally too, um, just a few links, um, the Mental Health Foundation of New Zealand, um, meditation resources from, um, oh, and actually there's a typo there. It should be Tara Bratch, not Tara Branch. Um, but she is phenomenal and she's really good at helping people start to meditate if they haven't done it before. Um, I meditate um, on the train coming into work. Um, it, you definitely um, you can't meditate if you're driving into work, um, but if you're on public transport, um, listening to a guided meditation um, can be really a, a nice way of sort of separating that non-work and work life from one another. Um, and then there's lots of writings online. Um, Brianna Wiest is um, has written tons on um, self-care and um, and wellness. Um, and that's just one of my favorite articles by her. Um, Dr. Michael Lamb talks about um, stress and um, sort of understanding your um, understanding your physiological stress responses. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, um, Marianne Elliott has um, a blog post about yoga for difficult times, and she includes a video demonstration of the of the alternate nostril breathing. Um, so that is everything I had. Um, thank you so much all for, um, for participating and listening. Um, and at this point, I think Julia is going to turn off the recording and we're um, going to have some conversation.